Hey, I'm Neil, and welcome to a walkthrough of a toy model of superposition. This is an anthropic paper within their Transformer Circuits agenda, which is a research program trying to reverse engineer what the hell is going on inside large language models like GPT-3. Because we just have these programs that can do things like write poetry and explain jokes, and we have no idea how they work. And uh, I sure would like to solve this. And so this paper is a really cute and elegant setup where they designed this really, really simple toy model to explore a phenomena we observe in language models that's really confusing called superposition, where models have more features than they have dimensions, and learn some weird voodoo where they learn to compress these features into this smaller number of dimensions. As a teaser to what we're going to talk about, Here's one of my favorite figures from the paper, which shows, which geometrically shows what superposition can look like. Here we have a model with five features that it needs to force into two dimensions, and sometimes it learns this wild pentagon structure, where each feature is just a different direction in this really nice geometric configuration. And this is even weirder. My second favorite figure is this mess, where it's kind of impenetrable. But what's going on here is that if you give the model more than two internal dimensions, but then way more features to represent, it still uses superposition to compress them. And now it has a wider range of geometric configurations, like triangles with three features in 2D, tetrahedra with four features in 3D, square antiprisms, which is a very weird type of polyhedron, with eight features in three dimensions. And not only do these appear inside networks, but the features self-organize into separate subspaces, with say, four features squashed into three dimensions, and then the next four features are squashed into a totally different three dimensions. Like this diagram shows that for this model, it's just learned seven tetrahedra. This model has learned a bunch of triangles and a bunch of antipodal pairs. This model has some antipodal pairs, a square antiprism, a pentagon, and whatever the hell this thing is that I think they called the everything bagel. And yeah, so in a moment I'm going to be joined by a collaborator, Jess Smith, and we're going to try to decipher what the hell is going on in this paper. Um, this is part one of two. Here we're mostly focusing on the high-level conceptual takeaways of this paper, how you should think about superposition, what the strengths and weaknesses of this work are, and what we can learn from it. If there's interest, we'll do a part two, where we dig a lot more into the guts and technical details of the paper. Two notes before we begin. First, I was not an author on this paper. I used to work at Anthropic, but I left before this work began, and so this is very much my perspective as an engaged outsider, and I'm sure the authors would have much higher quality takes on this than I do. And secondly is, this is a technical paper, and there are some specific details of how the toy model is set up that are pretty important to follow some of what we're saying. We try to explain them, but based on some feedback, if you feel confused, I recommend pausing the video, going to check out the paper, getting your head around what the toy model setup is, and then coming back. Without further ado, I'll be joined by Jess, and we'll jump into the paper. Awesome. So, before I actually start reading through the paper, it's always good to begin with just like, why does this paper exist? What is superposition? Why would you care about it? Fundamentally, this paper is about building toy models which need to learn more features than they have dimensions to explain. A feature is like some property of the input that can kind of independently vary. Here the input is literally just a set of random numbers and each random number is a feature that can kind of vary independently. And the model only has so many dimensions to represent these features. And superposition is where it uses more features than it has dimensions to represent via some fuckery. And the point of this paper is basically exploring what happens in a bunch of detail and then trying to go from this to learn things about real models. The important question you should ask whenever you start reading a paper about toy models is like, why is this useful? 
what is the thing that I care about in real models and why should I expect this to tell me anything? And so the core problem that we're trying to solve with this paper is this really annoying thing called neuron polysemanticity, where in general, a model is trying to represent something about the world. E.g. it's an image classification model that takes an image, breaks it down into a bunch of features, like does it contain curves? Does it contain fur? Does it contain a car? Shit like that. And then uses these features to piece together to come up with some final answer. A thing that often happens to be true is that the model uses a neuron to represent a single feature. The value represents how much the model thinks that feature is present. And there's been a bunch of work on things like this. Here's a previous paper that Chris Ola's old team at OpenAI made, where they were looking at this text plus image model called Clip. A lot of the fun bits of the paper are just all of these random neurons and shit they represent, like a Donald Trump neuron or an elderly neuron or a Pokemon neuron. And they make a pretty credible case that neurons represent different features. This is a really convenient thing to be true, because it means that if we look at a model, we can just say, ah, let's look at each neuron. This neuron is a number. Let's try to figure out what inputs and what properties of the input makes this number go big. And this is just like interpretability on easy mode. But it turns out that it is just not actually a universally true thing that models use a neuron to represent a feature. So here is one feature from Clip. And if we look at this is a website called OpenAI Microscope which is just wild resource they made that just shows you every neuron in a bunch of these imagey models and just tries to understand what they represent. And this is some weird psychedelic shit that shows us if you optimize what the model is looking at to like maximally activate this neuron, what kind of stuff you get. And you have pictures that are kind of about dice and kind of about cards. And so you might expect this neuron is about Dice, gambling, games, that kind of vibe. But then if you look at the pictures that optimize it, like, what the fuck is this? You've got loads of stuff that's just, like, random poems and about poetry and, like, what? This is... There are some things about dice, some things about games, some things about cards, but also lots of stuff that just seems wildly unrelated. And this is an example of neuron polysemanticity, where... You might hope that a neuron represents a single feature, uh, but it turns out it doesn't. And there are multiple things that make it activate. Here's a different thing. I was training this small model using a technique called SOLU that's from a different Transformer Circuits paper. And here is just like a list of the 10 bits of text that make the model activate the most. And if we scroll through, we see that sometimes the places where the model activates a lot are shit like this. Like, it sees the word refuges, and it really likes to activate on the UG of refuges. It's kind of weird, kind of niche, but like, maybe it just really likes that token and that word. But then, if you look at other things, the model really likes numbers inside brackets, especially punctuation. I don't know, here it's doing a bunch of Bible verses. If I scroll down, it's got some kind of legal text and really likes punctuation in the middle of that. Here it's got some kind of citation format. And I'm like, what? These are clearly wildly unrelated things. Why the hell is this neuron activating on both? That was a long ramble. Making sense so far, Jess? Yeah, I think it's good. I think if there's time at the end, it'd be interesting to talk about how you generate those psychedelic images that make the neurons activate so much. <laughs> Yeah, cool. Bit of a tangent, but I'm down to go through it at the end. But yeah, so this is the core challenge. This is like a pretty core challenge for mechanistic interpretability. We think the models represent features internally. We need to know what these features are to have any real hope of reverse engineering what the model is doing. 
And we kind of naively hope that it represents them with neurons. But it, in practice, seems to kind of but not quite do that. And I think it's also worth disentangling two similar but somewhat different things that it's easy to confuse, which are polysemanticity and superposition. So everything I showed here, which is examples of polysemanticity, which means you have one neuron that represents multiple things, like this neuron that represents poetry and dice. But a thing that could be going on is that the model has n neurons. It represents n features, but these directions just aren't perfectly aligned with the neurons. And in this world, it's like not the end of the world. We just need to use some better technique to find which directions mean features. And this is kind of fine. It's a bit of a pain. We can't just say it a certain stop, which things should be features, but it's probably not that big a deal. There's lots of techniques to reduce dimensions and find a basis. But then there's the separate idea of superposition, which is when the model has more features than dimensions, and it's learning to compress those down into these n dimensions. Like say it's got a thousand features, each feature is represented as a direction, but it's compressing them into 200 dimensional space. By linear algebra, you can only have 200 orthogonal directions in space. But you can have like many, many directions that are almost but not quite orthogonal. And this means that when you try to read out one feature, you I'm probably good if I draw a diagram for this while I load that. Making sense so far, Jess? Awesome. So does this work? Beautiful. So let's just get a whiteboard up. So uh, thanks to someone in the comments of my first YouTube video who suggested using a screen brush rather than the shitty loom drawing tool. So let's say we've got a two-dimensional space like the model just has two internal dimensions and it's trying to represent features. And let's say this is the neuron one axis and this is the neuron two axis. So if it has two features it wants to represent its directions, it might pick like axis one and axis two to do that. So now the feature is like this direction and this direction. And importantly, these are orthogonal. And so the way the model reads out a feature is it just projects the space onto this dimension. And if it projects everything onto neuron one, then it gets the entirety of feature one and it gets none of feature two because they're orthogonal. The model might do something like have instead feature two be like, let's delete that. The model instead might have feature two be like this direction. And this is kind of dumb because now when I project onto neuron one, I get something that's like got a bunch of interference between the two directions. But if the model only has two features, it can just obviously align them with the neuron axes. However, things get kind of fucked when you have more than two dimensions because you can't have three things that are all orthogonal. But you can have three things that are, say, like this. Where now, if you project everything onto this dimension, each of these have, like, some non-trivial projection. Like, this has more, so maybe it's kind of fine. If you pick things in this direction, this feature has a big projection onto this direction. These two have, like, some projection onto here, but it's kind of fine and ditto like this. And so roughly what's going on is that the model can choose to trade off between the usefulness of having more features. Having more features is just clearly useful. Like the ability to represent cars and fur and oceans is more useful than be able to represent cars and fur but not oceans. But also having low interference is useful. Like it's a lot more useful to me to be able to take something like oceans and just know perfectly it's an ocean. 
and that it's got nothing to do with furrow costs. But if I had something like this, then if there was ocean, I get a little bit of information that there's a car and a little bit of information that there's fur. And this just like creates a bunch of bullshit noise I need to deal with. But I get to represent more features. And so this is kind of this trade-off that the model needs to learn to deal with. And yeah, so the kind of core thing about superposition is A, does the model do it? B, how does it do it? And C, how does it think about this trade-off of more superposition, more features, but more interference versus less interference and more superposition? Cool, that was a long ramble. How much sense am I making so far, Jess? I think it's pretty solid. I think there's a, we'll, we'll probably get into this in a minute, but I think there's a really useful operationalization of, of features mentioned in the paper. Something, well, it relates to the, the, the simulation hypothesis. Uh, wait, do you mean the simulation hypothesis that we're all in a simulation or something more specific to models? The, the more specific, more specific, <laughs> although I guess they're all kind of related. <laughs> yeah, more specifically that you can, in some sense, think of models exhibiting superposition as simulating larger models, noisily simulating oh. larger models. Yep. And then that gives a useful definition of what a feature is. Because I think it's a reasonable question to be like, what are the sort of best features or true features that our model is trying to, to go for? Awesome. We will hopefully get to that. And yeah, I should probably say at the start that just like mechanistic interpretability is a pretty early, not super mature field. And we don't really have clear, precise, formal definitions. So a lot of this shit about features is kind of an intuitive notion that kind of makes sense to me. Different people will disagree about exactly what it means. And the things they do in this paper to try to get traction on it are like kind of useful and kind of principled, but you could totally imagine someone else trying to attack this problem having different approaches, or like a slightly different operationalization. And I don't know. Anyway. Let's jump into going through the paper. So, yeah, first they've just got intro, bunch of general flavor. The key thing is polysemanticity is a thing and it's kind of annoying. We look at toy models using real observations to look at superposition. And now they actually use the toy model they're using. So, or like the rough flavor of the toy model they use. So the thing that they're doing is they're saying, what is the dumbest thing we might want to look at that could show superposition? And so what are the properties you need for superposition? You've got to have features that can vary somewhat independently in the input. To be clear, by independently, I mean you can kind of reason about them as separate things, not knowing one is there tells you nothing about the other. Like floppy is and has fur are clearly correlated, but these are also kind of things you want to reason about independently. So you've got to have features. You've got to kind of be able to think of them separately. You've got to have some bottlenecks where so the input has these features in it, but then you map into a space that's smaller where you don't have as many dimensions as features. And then you've got some output where you can actually figure out how many features were represented. And the kind of, in some sense, really dumb thing you might want to try doing is you just have this autoencoder. So an autoencoder is a model that's trained to reproduce its own inputs with an internal structure that stops it fully having everything. And you start with, say, five features which is what they've drawn here. You map them down to some bottleneck dimension. So here we map down to two dimensions. You then map back up to five. And then you apply a ReLU to the end of that. ReLU just being classic kind of nonlinearity using networks. It's just like has a graph that looks like, has a graph that just looks like this, zero, then identity. And 
So what they do is they're like, look at these five features. Let's just say they're all uniform random variables. And this means that you can kind of think of each one as a feature where it's just like a number that kind of varies independently of the others. And then we train it to, at the end of the network, recover these five features using this ReLU activation to kind of clean up some of the noise. And what we see are, it, it's worth noting that the only reason you can have a ReLU here is that we say that these input features x are like uniform in the interval zero to one, i.e. they're positive. If they weren't positive, then the ReLU would totally break things because ReLU can't output negative things. But yeah, the other thing to know about this model is we don't have any nonlinearities in the middle. And they also set things to be symmetric. So this has linear ma map W, this has linear map. Okay, that's the overall setup. How much sense am I making, Jess? I think that makes sense. Is it important, the details of how the ReLU cleans up some of the noise? Kind of important, but we'll probably get to it later. Okay. So then the two insights they have for how to set up this, how to set up this model are they have, oh, so let me just explain how to interpret these diagrams. So you can basically, so W is this linear map from 5D to 2D. And this is just like a matrix with 10 elements where each row is like, what are the 2D coordinates that each feature maps to? And then we multiply W by its transpose and apply a ReLU to try to recover the original features. And this is very easy to plot in a 2D space. You're just like, these are two numbers. That's the X and Y coordinate of something. And so like the yellow thing is the first number. The green thing is the second number. This is the third number, etc. I might have the order wrong, but whatever. And one like insight I have from this paper is just if you're dealing with toy models, having one of the dimensions be like two or three is just really useful because you can plot shit. And plotting shit is great. And turns out that sometimes toy things with like a two or three dimensional thing are simple enough that you can actually usefully learn things from it and just plot it. It's wild. But yeah, so these diagrams represent like how are these different features embedded in space? And we see that in some model setups, you just have two features that are orthogonal. In some model setups, you have like four features that are orthogonal-ish, but like not pairwise orthogonal. Like this feature and this feature are definitely not orthogonal. And then in some cases, you have this weird thing. And so there are now two more really important things to track about this problem setup. And the two things are importance and sparsity. And these are like really important things about the model setup they have, which is kind of a lot of the interesting things I took away from this paper, because I would not have predicted that these were as big a deal as they were but they really change the nature of the problem. And so intuitively, what importance means is how important is it to the model to represent this feature? How much does it matter to the model to represent this thing? And for the purpose of their really dumb toy model, importance is just literally a weight on the loss function. Like they have loss equals the sum over the i features of like, so if you start with like input feature x, you estimate input feature x hat i, you subtract off the original feature x i, and you square it. The sum of this is like mean squared error loss. It's a pretty natural thing to do. And 
you might then multiply by some coefficient that's like, how important is this feature? In standard mean squared error loss, C is just one for everything. But what they do here is they vary the Cs. What they actually have is something like they vary it exponentially. Like they have something that's like, I don't know, e to the one, e to the point eight, et cetera, until e to the zero. So it's like varying ex like varying line linearly in log space, like varying exponentially. I think it might be E is because there's only five, it might be E 0 0.75. But the exact setup they have doesn't really matter. The important thing is just we're varying the importance. The thing this is intended to track in real models is just like how useful is it to represent features? Where, so say if you look at a language model, you might expect to have a neuron that represents something like am I speaking German or am I speaking English? Or is this a romance novel or is this Python code? And that's like a really fucking important feature. <laughs> like if you don't know you're a romance novel versus Python code, you're like, what? Then, then there's features like, is this the token UG in Refuges? And I'm like, that, that can't be that important. 99.99% .99 of text does not have the word Refuges in it. And the motion actually true. I don't know how common words are. 99% of text cannot have the word refuges in it. And so, like intuitively, if the model has features of differing importance and it's trying to represent them, you might expect it to give the really important features their own dimension. Because if you shove another thing in into that dimension, there's going to be interference on this really important feature. And the fact that there's interference on this really important feature makes it harder to use. And so if there's kind of loss decreasing benefit from having more features, and there's loss decreasing benefit to having low interference, intuitively, the more important feature is, the more significant the interference is. And so sticking in an unimportant feature just seems kind of dumb. Note that there's two separate claims here. One is that there's going to be lower total superposition if I have more important and less important features. The second claim is that if some features are more important than others, those features are more likely to have dedicated dimensions than other ones. So that's important. That makes sense, Jess? Yep. Great. And significantly, this is just like a actual real feature of real data and models. And this is just like a kind of janky, hacky way to represent our toy model that's good enough to give us some insights. The second thing is sparsity. And so what sparsity means is how many features are present at any given time. And this is another pretty important thing because it is just a feature of the world that most concepts are not present at any given time. This is pretty clear if we look at this neural example where, oh, sorry, let me give myself the ability to actually move around. So if you go back to this neuron, it's like, I don't know, punctuation inside brackets or numbers inside brackets, that is not there most of the time. Refuges is not there most of the time. There's another neuron I have in this model that I think is fucking wild. It's Neuron 2. And Neuron 2 really likes highlighting on news articles about British football. Like, this is about a team called Arsenal, it's often called the Gunners or Manchester City. And it really likes activating on capitalized tokens at the start of proper nouns. And this is so fucking niche. Also, why does this model represent that? But that is a separate issue. <laughs> But like these are some really niche features. And so it is just clearly not the case that the model has the model needs to represent things at any given time. It is clearly not the case that real models are going to have all of the features being present. The hacky way they represent it in this is that they say, okay, so 
rather than each feature being present all of the time, but uniform, I'm going to give it like an X percent probability of being zero. So like rather than the distribution looking like, uh, oh, sorry, rather than the distribution looking like this, oh God, rather than the distribution looking like this, I'm instead going to say that the distribution looks like this. So there's like this massive weight on zero, and then, sorry, there's this massive weight on zero, and then things are otherwise pretty small and low down. There's like an 80%, so like in this picture, there's an 80% chance at zero, a 20% chance it's uniform between zero and one. And we set these all to be independent, but at any given time, you're probably not going to have more than two features valid, and on average it's going to be one feature that one feature that's there. And so intuitively, this is a pretty big deal, because if we look at this picture, we see that like each like sorry, we see that each of these features projected onto the first feature is like significant ish. That's like a third. These two are like very significant, though, because they're negative, we'll see later that it can kind of use the ReLU to clear them up. And so if all of these features are present, then if we try to add, if we try to figure out whether this feature is present, we're going to have like, I don't know, this feature be there, this feature be there, these two features being there, and that's pretty bad. And then we have like a variable width thing from this feature, which like, I don't know, might be up to here, might be up to here, might be up to here, who knows? And, but like, this is clearly a total mess. Like we get to here and we think that means that this yellow feature is like mostly in this direction, when actually it's like strongly in this direction. And so it's completely fucked. But if instead each of these things is like not to there most of the time, that means that probably what we're going to get is that this direction purely represents this feature. If we get a little bit of stuff in this direction, because one of these features is there and no other features are there, then we might say, oh, we got a little bit of noise here. We can do some cleanup where we're just like, if there's a bit of noise, we're going to assume it doesn't really match this feature. But like most of the time, if there's a strong signal, it means this feature is there, and there's a small bias because sometimes other things might be in there. But just like the total interference is so much lower. And to reiterate, the way they represent sparsity with this not there most of the time, maybe there some of the time thing is like kind of janky. This is not necessarily how features will happen in the real world. In particular, the sparsity of features is going to depend a lot on correlation. Like the feature, is this a list variable in Python code? Or is this variable sorted in Python code? A clearly correlated. While is this about an edgy teenage vampire, like edgy hot vampire and teenage romance novel is wildly uncorrelated from that. But mm, Turns out the thing they do here is basically good enough, and later they do look at adding in sparse. They, later they do look at adding in correlation. How am I doing so far, Jess? I think one thing that that when I was reading this paper shed some light on it for me was like, I think the paper says there's exponentially many almost orthogonal. You touched on this earlier. Almost orthogonal directions <laughs> for the number of dimensions in the space. So like really like you can have an insane number of almost orthogonal, I don't know, directions or features represented in, in your space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a pretty good point. One, yeah, so, yeah, so rephrasing what Jess said into what I consider the like high level insight here, big dimensional spaces are fucking weird. We spend most of our life in small spaces, like two and 3D, and so our intuitions about, say, how a thousand dimensional space works is kind of whack. And there's this specific point of you can compress lots and lots of directions into, say, thousand dimensional space 
that are almost but not quite orthogonal in a way that you just completely can't in two-dimensional space. So just to like try to give a bit of intuition for like why this happens, there's this important property of 2D of spaces that more, if you take say the set of points that are distance one from the origin, so like in 2D, it's a circle, in 1D, it's just like a line segment, uh, sorry, it's just like these two points on a line segment, in 3D, it's like a sphere, and then you pick an extreme point on this, and you look at, I don't know, how many things are almost orthogonal to it. In 1D, there's nothing. In 2D, there's like these two small segments. In 3D, it's like actually this entire shading around the equator. And each time you go up in dimensions, this thing gets bigger. And the kind of rough intuition is just you're varying a bunch of these dimensions semi-independently. And only one of these directions means there's a dot product with this point. The other, like, zero, one, and two dimensions have no dot products. And the more dimensions you have, the more ways there is to vary shit. And it turns out that if you just go to, say, 100 dimensions, like, almost all of the volume of this or the surface area of this like n-dimensional sphere is concentrated around this equator. And there's basically nothing in this region that's like close to the North Pole or close to the South Pole. Even if we define close to be like, I don't know, this point onwards. And this is just like one of the many weird facts about high dimensional spaces that are sometimes useful to know for staring at neural networks because they live in like several hundred to many thousand dimensional space and it's kind of a fucking mess. It's not actually super important if you didn't follow that because high dimensional spaces are fucky. The kind of key takeaway from that is just high dimensional spaces are fucked. Your intuitions from 2 and 3D spaces don't transfer super well and it's a lot easier to compress things in without that much overlap in high dimensional spaces especially if you can exploit sparsity to say that the interference doesn't matter that much. How am I doing, Jess? Sorry, doing great. I did a thumbs up. Great. Another point while I'm talking about this is that it's worth disentangling what we mean by interference within a model and what it means for a model to read out features from some internal representation. Because I think that these are things that it's pretty easy to be confused about. So there's kind of two. So the in the model described in this paper, you've got like big linear space, you map down to small linear space, and then you map back up to big linear space. This is the central space where you get mapping in and mapping out. And the key thing is the only things we're doing to the space are like map embedding in with some linear map and reading out with some linear map. But importantly, these are just like pretty different operations. And so when we have this like pentagon figure that they had in the paper, the pentagon represents the embedding operation where like each of these five features is mapped to a direction, and you can kind of just conceptually reason about where the dimensions go, and they just correspond to this kind of starfishy thing. But then if you're trying to read out a dimension, you're projecting, sorry, I have my words all around. This is projecting a big dimensional space to a small one, and each dimension in the big space can be cleanly represented like this, here we're embedding this small 2D space into big space. And so the actual thing you think about here is like, you have two dimensions. What do these two dimensions map to in five dimensional space? And the naive way you try to read out this dimension is you project onto it, which basically means dot producting with it. And then you get this interference. But A, 
This is just like a fundamentally different operation from embedding it in this small space. Like reading and writing are different operations that are not fully converses. Point two is that this isn't the only way you could try to read out this feature. You could also try to dot product with like, I don't know, this direction. This is a less good direction because some other features might have bigger dot product with it. But if, they're, if this feature is really sparse, ah, uh, who cares? And this means that, and the other point is that this kind of projecting down versus embedding up is actually pretty analogous to how real models do things because real models are doing this these like linear map operations all the time even if they don't have this tight bottleneck dimension. And so this is important because it means that, words. this means that if the model is trying to get out some information from some internal representation and it's trying to do something with it, it has to be doing something like projecting onto some direction. And kind of the reason I'm making a big deal out of this beyond all the specific maths is just both the embed operation and the project operation are represented by taking some dimension in space. These are often the same dimension, but the project down and the embed back up things, even though they both kind of can be represented by one direct by the same direction in space, are fundamentally different operations. And it's worth keeping that in your head when we're talking about superposition to check, like, are we talking about um, right or like an embed operation, or are we talking about a, yeah. are we talking about a right or a project operation, or are we talking about a read and an embed operation? Now, it's kind of convoluted. How am I doing, Jess? I think, I think pretty good. I think, yeah, I think this stuff will become more clear in context. Yeah, makes sense. The final high level point I want to make before I like jump back into the paper properly is Again, toy models only interesting in that they actually track real things about real models. And there's actually several points within a transformer where superposition matters. And it's worth kind of cleanly distinguishing what those are because they've got pretty different properties. So just thinking briefly about how a transformer works, you have an embedding which takes a token and maps it into this residual stream space. You map something from residual stream space to an MLP layer, which has an in operation. There's then some activation in the middle. That's, I know you can pretend it's a ReLU. In fact, people normally use Jellus nowadays. There's some out linear operation. And then this adds back to the residual stream and then we unembed. This is some like really shitty compressed transformer. There's like a bunch more layers and a bunch more shit. But this is an add, sorry, this is an add operation. These two are read operations. This is a write operation. And this is a small space. This is a big space. This is a bigger but still kind of small space. And Let's represent things with my kind of trapezium notation from earlier. So like this is the embed, goes from very big to pretty small. Let's, yeah, very small. The in operation goes from kind of small to moderately big because there are more MLPs. Then there's ReLU. Then you go from pretty big to like, small-ish because we're in the residual stream, we add back, and then we go back to big for the unembed. And so which operations here are linear? This operation is, yeah, linear. The embedding map is linear. The input map is linear. The output map is linear. The writing map the kind of addition map is linear and the unembed is linear. 
And you can kind of think of the residual stream, which is small, as a bottleneck dimension that the model might want to put things into. And let's just like give things numbers to like represent how big they are. I know typical numbers you might get, 50,000, 1,000, 4,000. And so the residual stream is this 1,000 dimensional thing between a 50,000 thing and a 4,000 thing, and then another 50,000 thing. The model kind of cares about representing everything in its input vocab, so it's going to be compressing a lot of shit down here. And importantly, this is purely linear. Then you've got a, another kind of bottleneck dimension. You've got a bunch more neurons than you have dimensions in the residual stream, but it's still a fair bit fewer than the input and the output, and it's way fewer than like all of the conceptual features you might represent in the world. But importantly, this thing is not linear. And if we're trying to figure out the interference between trying to read out one feature and reading out unrelated features, if we're in purely linear space, this is pretty nice because if even if some features overlap with this central feature, the amount of interference is just like their projection onto this feature, and that just kind of purely adds up. Like if the justice feature is there, we have this much movement. If this feature is there, we kind of go down a bit. But if you've got some non-linear operation, then interference can kind of get magnified and fucked with. And so let's imagine we're squaring. If we're squaring, having this feature gets us something big. But then if we square just this much, we get something much smaller. And so even though this thing represented like a pretty small move, if you squared that, you'd end up with a pretty small thing. You lost like a lot of information. And just generally, if something is nonlinear, adding other shit in can fuck with it a bunch. Um, even though squaring is kind of an extreme example that may not track real networks properly. And so in the activation within here, superposition kind of fucks with us a bunch of interference becomes a much bigger deal. And so in most of the paper, they're only studying this residual stream style superposition. And only towards the end, so they really engage with this neuron style thing, where each dimension has a nonlinear thing acting on it in a way that's probably going to magnify interference. The other thing worth tracking about neuron activations that's fucky is that generally what happens is you've got an activation that acts on each dimension. It's like, say you had two neurons and you had a ReLU, you'd do a ReLU on the X and Y axis separately. So like this direction is unchanged, this direction, the ReLU on the X sets it to zero, the ReLU on the Y is unchanged. So this maps to this. Down here, the X ReLU maps to zero and the Y ReLU maps to zero. So this maps here. And what this means is that if you've got two features, you really want to represent them with this axis and this axis. And if you represent them with, say, this axis and this axis, you're kind of fucked because the amount each thing is there is going to really mess with you. And so in some sense, it's like really surprising that we get neuron polyspanticity because neurons have these activations, which would be a really strong forcing function saying, don't have interference, align your features with the canonical directions. While it should be way easier to do superposition in these like bottleneck dimensions. And yeah, long ramble, the key thing to take away from that is look at the thing we're studying at the moment is bottleneck dimensions. We'll touch on neurons later. In some sense, neurons are more interesting because they're deeply related to the polysemanticity we talked about earlier. But even this superposition is interesting, and it's in some ways a lot easier to reason about and study. But they do at the end of the paper try to talk about neurons, and I think there are still some useful lessons to be gained. End long ramble. How much of a mess was that, Jess? I think I think it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Awesome. All right. Now I should now I should probably go talk about the paper and try to go on slightly fewer tangents. <laughs> but yes. So.
The key thing this diagram is trying to show is that the sparser the features are, the more the model likes superposition, which is kind of not crazy, broadly makes sense. This is what would be going on. As I was saying, the more sparsity there is, the less superposition matters. And also in some sense, the main times you care about getting sparsity out, sorry, the main times you care about getting a feature out is when the feature is present, which is like not most of the time if it's really sparse. And so that's kind of another reason you can care about interference a bit less. And actually, I'm just gonna to totally scratch that. I don't think what I just said made any sense. Please pretend I said nothing for the last 30 seconds. But yeah, sparsity. And so, yeah. The other important thing is that they add the end of the network, they add a rel. And this is actually pretty important. So the reason this really matters is, so let's look at this model and think about what happens with and without a rel. So we're projecting things onto this feature dimension. And it's like pretty important. And like these two have pretty big interface Interference. But then the way we set up the model, we project to the 2D thing, we project back up to the 5D thing, projecting back up to the first dimension is projecting onto here, and then we apply a ReLU. But in the world where one of the, where say this feature is active and this feature is not active, we're going to get a very negative projection out, and then the ReLU is going to set that to zero. And this means that the model kind of doesn't care that much that this feature is there when the yellow feature is not there because the ReLU can clean it up. It's worth flagging that there's two similar concepts here that is easy to confuse. The first concept is how much do features interfere when they are both present? And the ReLU has not solved that problem. Like if the yellow feature is there and the green feature is there, we have like this amount. And it's pretty difficult to clean that up with a ReLU because you kind of can't tell the difference between whether this came from yellow and green or whether this came from like yellow, be yellow being a bit there and green not being there. And then there's the separate concept of if we think that this direction means yellow and there's some amount of information here, but actually yellow isn't there and it comes from other shit, how much does this screw us over by predicting the wrong value for yellow? And the ReLU solves the second case, but not the first case. But this is a good indication of the general phenomena of the model wants to explicitly use some of its parameters to clean up the noise. And this is, there's actually probably a bunch of creative ways models can do this in the real world so that aren't available in this model. For example, let's say you've got 20 neurons and you're reading Python code or romance novels, as you know, the two classic kinds of texts that exist in the world that are all GP3 have cares about. And you've got like a romance novel neuron, a code neuron, and then like 18 other neurons. And each of these neurons represents either some property, represents both some property of romance novels and some property of code. A thing you could totally do is like map each of these 18 neurons out to like some output thing. We've got like some romance processing node over here. Yeah, some like romance section over here, some like code processing section over here, and then have the romance neuron do like a massive negative amount to everything in the code processing section and the code neuron do a massive negative amount to everything in the romance section and then have each neuron feed into both the romance processing section and the code processing section and then what we might see here is that if a romance feature is there it adds a massive negative thing to the code so that all computation from each neuron that might be to do with code gets zeroed out because it's actually about romance, but all the romance processing code works. Meanwhile, if there's actually code and each of these represents a code feature, 
then all of the romance thing gets fucked while all of the code bit is working totally fine. And so what's going on in this toy example is the model is actually able to use just like two neurons to achieve a lot of interference cleaning up because of the input features are kind of correlated and anti-correlated. And this is like another toy model you might have that shows how models can like actively dedicate some of their parameters to cleaning up interference. Kind of a tangent, I'm not actually sure this links that much to what the paper is showing, but I'd be surprised if nothing of this is happening in real models, so it seemed worth briefly going into. Ah, so, all right, yeah. So this is gonna be a future section about how models can perform computation superposition. This is basically a fancy word for have superposition in neurons where there are more features than there are dimensions and you apply an activation directly to that and show that it can get useful stuff out, which links to the simulation hypothesis that you mentioned, Jess. Sorry, I do not like the term simulation hypothesis because it makes me think about Nick Bostrom. The hypothesis that small networks are simulating big sparse networks. And yeah, related work stuff. Yeah, why do toy models happen? Blah. They also have some cool shit about phase diagrams, which I'll get to later. And yeah, random shit. Yeah, a kind of general point about toy models papers is I think they can be useful. I think it's also easy to get really nerd sniped by random shit that's not generalized, but is really pretty. And I'm going to try to give like fairly blunt takes throughout this about which bits of this paper feel like a random nerd snipe to me versus which bits seem like true and deep things about models. No shade on the Anthropic team, they're definitely aware about this failure mode, but I think it's worth tracking, especially if you're a researcher, i.e. the kind of person who gets nerd sniped all the time <laughs> because we're playing around with such weird, fun ideas every day. So yeah, takeaways. Superposition is real observed phenomena, seems pretty important and pretty legit. Yeah, superposition, real observed phenomena, pretty important, pretty legit. Neurons can form, also pretty important and legit. Um, the kind of implication of this is that even if you've got a model where you look at some neurons and you see weird polysemantic shit, that doesn't mean that all neurons are going to be weird and polysemantic. And it doesn't mean that the trying to interpret neurons lens is totally fucked. All it means is that you need to be pretty careful and check. You might expect the features that are least sparse and really important just have a dedicated neuron. I was saying earlier, computation, basically just saying the thing I was saying earlier about like, you can have superposition in neurons this weird thing about where the features are in superposition is governed by a phase change, where here, yeah, phase change is this kind of weird word that people have started using in mechanistic interpretability in a bunch of contexts, like my Brocking work and the induction heads paper. I'll talk more about phase change when we get to it, but it's kind of a weird term and it's kind of a bit controversial what it actually means and how to use it. And then you get this weird ass thing where the model organizes features into geometric structures. The classic, why the fuck is there a tetrahedron in my neural network tweet? I'm not actually convinced this is that relevant to real models, and I'm mostly going to label this as a bit of a nerd snipe, but there's a few things in here that seem kind of cool. Mm. And also, it's fucking wild that it happens. All right, ready to jump in? Great. So, yeah, definitions and motivations. I often think of neural networks. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is a pretty good fundamental point. So, like, I talked about this a fair bit in my Transformer Circuits walkthrough, but we think that models have internal representations of features. Um, and Fundamentally, neural networks are linear algebra machines. Most of what they're doing is a bunch of matrix multiplications 
And then there's some weird shit layered on top, like ReLUs and softmaxes that are kind of very simple functions between all of the massive matrix multiplications. We need the nonlinearities because otherwise the model can only represent linear things. Well, I don't know, there's some bullshit theorems that if you've got two linear maps, if you've got two linear maps followed by like with a really wide thing in the middle, and then some linear non-linearity in the middle. If it's sufficiently wide, this can represent any function. This isn't actually that relevant to real deep learning, but it's a fun theorem to be true. But yeah, neural networks are linear algebra machines with a little bit layered on top. And the standard way that you might want to represent information in a vector space is as directions. But it's like not obvious that this is actually what's going on. It will be really convenient if this is what's going on, but we don't know for confident that this, we don't like know for sure this is what's actually happening. And we've got a bunch of suggestive evidence. But yeah, I think it is worth like clearly tracking in your mind, which claims that people make are like obviously true a priori versus which claims people make a kind of complicated empirical claims about reality. Just to give like a, few alternate ways the world might look. One thing you might get, which Conjecture have some interesting research on, is that things are represented with polytopes. The kind of, this means that the network picks regions in space rather than directions to represent features. Like you might divide up the plane to like different squares and say each of these squares represents a feature. And different bits later in the network can do some creative shit to like tell which square something is in. And like, this is a kind of legit way of representing information. The model might have some nonlinear thing, like some binary code. Like if, if like, if the X direction and the Y direction are there, feature one, if X and not Y feature two, if Y not X feature three, if neither feature four, this is like another thing you might do that's kind of legit. It's not obvious to me that this thing is better than four, than like feature one, feature two, feature three, feature four as like four separate directions in 2D space. And in practice, I'm like pretty confident in the features of directions hypothesis, but like it's very possible that something else is going on and that all of the shit we see as polysemanticity that we're like, oh, it's using more directions in space than it has dimensions. It might just be us being confused and it's actually doing some shit like this where we're just noticing one and three, or it's doing some shit like this, but we're just noticing this square, this square, and this square. And, mm -hmm. and I think one cool thing about this paper is it's like pretty objectively true in this paper that things are representing features as directions. Though it is also worth tracking that, like, it's not obviously the case that the model is doing this in general. Like, this is a toy model, things are perfectly generalized. But yeah, uh, this is just laying out those kinds of frameworks. Yeah, so yeah, this is the claim that features represent by direction. There's also this kind of deeper claim that networks represent features at all, like a kind of in my opinion, the most wild claim of mechanistic interpretability is that there is a mechanism a network to understand at all. Like, these aren't just bullshit, uninterpretable black boxes that do some nonsensical black magic. These are actually implementing some kind of decomposable, somewhat localizable mechanism internally that can be used to do computation. And this idea that it has independently understandable features in my opinion, is strongly borne out by the evidence. But it's also just like, like the biggest thing that Chris's circuits work has changed my mind about. Sorry, that is Chris Ola, who I'll refer to a bunch in all of these videos because he is the main research lead behind all of the transformer circuit stuff and all of the image circuit stuff and basically just invented the entire field of mechanistic interpretability and is also just quality human being. But yeah, things can be represented as independently understandable features. It's also worth just underscoring 
how fucked we would be if networks were not decomposable into things like this. Like, I don't know, GP3 is 200 billion premises. If you can't break GPT-3 down into like smaller modules or chunks or bits or features to look at, not necessarily directions, but just like bits that are kind of meaningful on their own where you don't need to think too hard about the rest of the network, I think we're probably just totally screwed at figuring out what's going on inside of it. I think if this was the case, the mechanistic interpretability agenda is just like basically dead, that there may be some ways of like making some alternate version of it that recovers some of the spirit. And I know folks at Redwood Research are doing some interesting work in this direction. But yeah, decomposability. Yeah. So yeah, two important concepts. I talked about this a fair bit at the beginning. But yeah, so this idea of a privileged basis is saying that if we just take the model architecture before we've trained it, can we predict what basis directions features will align to? This is kind of a interesting non-trivial statement about networks that comes from what I was saying earlier about relus and how you have activation functions that are aligned with the coordinate dimensions. The, yeah, if you've got a relu that acts on the x-axis and a relu that acts on the y-axis, representing a feature with each dimension means they can vary independently, representing them with not these means they can't. And it's also really useful to have this because you don't need to go hunting for a basis. And then there's the separate thing, superposition, which is like more features than dimensions. I think it's worth running a bit on the idea of a privileged basis, because I think it's a really deep and fundamental concept of mechanistic interpretability that it's pretty easy to kind of be confused about. So the first point is that, yeah, naively you look at a network and you're like, it's got these neurons. Neurons should obviously be features. And I think this is just like actually a pretty bad way of thinking about it, because when you encounter vector spaces in like their first forms in like engineering or physics, you often will think about it as just like a vector is three numbers, A, B, and C. And obviously A, B, and C are meaningful. And that's how you understand this vector. But like, actually, I think the way we think about vectors is as directions in space. This is a direction it is not the x coordinate and the y coordinate. And you could totally pick some other set of coordinate axes and represent the feature as coordinates in those. And this would be an equally legit way of representing the same direction in geometric space. To think you might have a privileged basis. The only way you get that is if you have features that are not invariant under a change of basis. So like, if you just have the residual stream, and you've got like an unembedding to it and like a neuron input reading from it. This is just a purely linear thing because this is the product of two matrices. And you could completely change this without changing the input and output. Like W E W N equals W E times R times inverse times w in. And this is going to significantly change the internal representation, but it's not going to change the inputs and outputs. So there's like, in the abstract, there's no reason you'd have a privileged basis on something where everything doing accessing it is linear. In practice, this is actually true for the residual stream and query key and value vectors inside transforms, but it's not true of neural activations. Though, so here's one caveat to give to this, is I think that because fundamentally the neural networks we study are computation objects represented in a computer, rather than, sorry, computational objects represented in a computer, rather than abstract linear algebra objects, it's worth keeping track of when we're using our mathsy linear algebra hat and when we're using our like these are bits in a computer and everything is floating points and floating points fucking suck, hat on. And it actually turns out that the way you represent a vector as floats in a computer is always privileged. And in practice, I actually think of it a bit more as a kind of spectrum of how privileged a basis is. 
Just to like briefly elaborate on what I meant there, though this is a massive tangent, it really does not matter if you don't follow this. The way models are represent, the way floating points are represented in the computer are you've got say 32 bits and they've got a sine bit, which is like plus or minus one. Then you've got some bits that represent the like floating point. So this is representing it as a number between one and two. So like this represents, you got the number one, zero, one, one, zero, whatever in binary. And then you've got like an exponent bit here. And this represents the multiply by two. It's got another sign in here, plus or minus, and then like another string of numbers in binary. And a key thing about this is that the precision you can represent a number with is somewhat independent of where the exponent is. Sorry, it is not independent of where the exponent is. The fractions you can represent are like fractions of how big the floating point is. And this means that if you've got a number that's like 2 to the 8 times 1.05 as x, and 2 to the minus 8 times 1.97 as y, you can represent both of these with pretty well because you're varying the exponent and you're varying the fraction, and the fraction is kind of relative to how big the number is. But if you pick a different basis, like x plus y and x minus y, from the picture of linear algebra, it should be basically equivalent. But now y is just going to get like basically rounded away in both of these, because now the excellent bit is going to be 2 to the 8. And so, and this is totally a tangent. I have a Twitter thread about this. If you want to go read it in more detail. And I think this is behind some weird shit, like emotion features on the residual stream. But yeah, computers are weird. Linear algebra is a leaky abstraction, but I think there is still some merits to this notion of a privileged basis. And that was a massive tangent. So if you didn't follow that, don't worry. How much of that massive tangent was comprehensible, Jess? I think it was quite comprehensible, I think perhaps worthy of its own video because it's like pretty interesting in and of itself. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. A general meta point about how I approach teaching things is I'm going to go on a lot of random tangents, throwing in stuff I think is worth knowing. Most of these tangents do not build on each other. If you don't follow one, skip ahead a bit and I'll start talking about it and talk about something else. And if you get lost at some point in the video, that hopefully does not mean the entire video is lost to you. But yeah. All right, so things. Ooh, this is some related work that I don't know. I should go check these out later. Yes, this is claiming superposition hypothesized. Seems plausibly useful, but not aware that anyone has like cleanly and perfectly demonstrated it before. And the point of the paper is to demonstrate this. Yeah, so this is trying to better flesh out what we mean by features. I should say that something I just really love about Chris Ola style papers is that they just like really go into detail to try to spell out all of the various assumptions and concepts underlying them. And I feel that often academic papers do not do this as much as I'd like them to, or like hold themselves to, to too high a standard of rigor rather than being willing to be like, we don't have a rigorous thing, here's a bunch of intuition pumps. And yeah, here's a bunch of intuition pumps about what features mean. These definitely are not things you need to understand in full detail, but the kind of core high level thing is some component or property of the input that is a function of the input rather than of the model, like things you might expect to be true of the world in the same way fur is a true fact about an image, not a fact about the model's representation of an image, and that it's useful for the model to represent these. It's useful for the model to be able to kind of reason about them separately. Like, I don't know, the is this an item of clothing and is this a shirt feature is very correlated, but it's pretty useful to be able to say, imagine from the perspective of the model, 
it's probably pretty useful to have counterfactual of like, if I was as confident this is either clothing, but I removed the is this a shirt feature, how would that change my prediction? This is kind of the difference between thinking of a model as something that's able to causally reason about things versus thinking of the model as just this massive correlation machine. That was kind of confused. That, how much sense did that make? I think it was, yeah, maybe rephrase it one, one, one other time. Okay, so two perspectives you might have about neural networks. One of them is neural networks are just like this massive pattern matching engine, which just picks up on loads of weird correlations about the world, can't tell the difference between random spurious correlations that happened to be there because it didn't have enough data or it had weird data versus like true correlations in the world, like person wearing buttoned white collared shirt correlates with person wearing blazer because they're probably wearing a suit versus like random correlational things. And then there's a kind of separate way you might think about reasoning about the world, which is with some kind of causal model. Like if it is, I don't know, if it is raining, then the pavement will be wet or the road will be wet. If it is not raining and has not rained for a while, I do not predict the road will be wet. And in this case, you might have several variables that feed into some conclusion. And the variables might be kind of correlated, but within the causal model style framework, you can kind of think of these as being things you can independently vary. Like if fur and floppy ear and, I don't know, whisker, what's a dog feature? big canines, then dog. What happens if I've got fur and big canines but not floppy ears? Maybe it's more like a wolf or a different kind of breed of dog or something. Even though these features are all correlated, we can think about them as different things. And both the network can internally do coherent things as these things vary, but also in theory we could intervene on the network, change one of these features, and look at how the output changes. And in my opinion, this is kind of one of the big differences between random pattern matching things that are just kind of picking up on loads of random correlations versus something that's actually building some internal model doing some coherent logic. And it's both wild and fascinating to think that models might be doing some kind of causal logic. Fascinating to think we might be able to interpret this and like really validate this. And also if they are doing some kind of I don't want to call it reasoning, that's anthropomorphizing too much, but like processing of features in this kind of algorithmic way. That seems like it'll make our job as rever network reverse engineers, engineers much easier. That make more sense the second time around? Yeah, definitely. Great. To flag, a lot of what I'm saying is kind of speculative things. This can be totally false, and this would not mean mechanistic interpretability as a field is fucked. And I expect other people in the field to disagree about like at least a third of my tangents, but whatever. Anyway, whirlwind tour of the things in here. Understanding this is not actually incredibly important, though I think these are all intrinsically cool and worth understanding on your own. First is this idea of word embeddings. This is like a super old result. Well, old by the standards of deep learning. So, you know, 2013. I did a pure math degree, so I'm used to old, meaning like 17 to 1800s or possibly ancient Greeks. <laughs> so the field of AI is pretty weird. <laughs> but yeah, word embeddings, the key idea of word embeddings is you pick some language task, like, I don't know, if this word is present, what is the probability that other words are, that like another given word is within five of that? And you train it to have some like factorized, you train it again with some kind of autoencoder style thing, where it maps from the space of many words to some small bottleneck space. And there's this classic paper that found this wild result that if you look at how things are represented, there seems to be some weird properties. Like the difference between king and queen is the same as the difference between man and woman. And if you add the difference between man and woman to king, you go from king to queen. And 
to suggest there's a is royalty direction and an is gender direction inside this bottleneck space that then gets mapped out to these four separate things over here. Anecdotally, I hear that this thing is kind of overblown. It doesn't replicate super well and was like slightly then doing a flashy thing, but like still wild. And I think there's definitely some truth to it. And also props to them for doing interesting interruptibility in like 2013. Latent spaces, so generative adversarial networks or GANs are models that take some input, map it to some smaller space, map that to like something that's trying to simulate the input, and half the time they get random noise, half the time they get real inputs, and there's this fucky thing where they're trained in conjunction with another discriminating network to be able to generate realistic images, whether it's noise or a real image, and apparently people have found interruptible directions in there. I did not know that. I should go read this paper. Interruptible neurons. Yep, I talked a bunch about that. And yeah, that's, that totally covers things like all of these interruptible neurons. And yeah. Another notably wild paper is this curve detectors paper that just goes into an excruciating amount of detail showing that some network, some neurons within this image classification network are detecting curves and a few other things, which are pretty cool. And yeah, interactable neurons seems like strong evidence that features are represented as directions in space because a neuron is just a direction in the model's internal space. This is some wild shit about how models, different models, potentially with different architectures trained on the same data, seem to learn similar features, like these high-low frequency detectors, which are these wild features in input models, image models, that seem to detect whether in some small patch of an image you get something that's like high frequency, like I know static, or fur, or something that's super noisy, this is something that's low frequency, that's just like pretty smooth, like I don't know, the screen is pretty smooth and noticing some contrast between them. I like totally would not have expected this to be a feature that's useful in image models, or like a feature it learns. But it learns this pretty early on, and feature train on models train on different distributions, train on different kinds of images and different architectures and with different random seats, I think, can learn them. And yeah, then there's this other random point about polysemanticity, the thing we are trying to resolve in this approach, in this work. Yes. End the long tangent. Key thing to take away from this. There's a bunch of evidence that features as directions. It's not overwhelming, but I think this is a pretty reasonable working hypothesis, and a lot of work kind of relies on this. How am I doing, Jess? Good. Great. What are features? Yep. Ooh, they give three definitions of features. I love it. So features as arbitrary functions. There's yeah, I don't know, you can kind of think, so this seems like kind of too general as a definition of feature, because function is a stupidly diverse and, I don't know, many, many things are functions. This is like a very, very large space, and we think there's something special about features. I like their example of cat and Kara features, well, cat plus car and cat minus car are, features, are, are not features, even though in some sense you can, a model which has a cat in a car direction is also a model that has a cat plus car and a cat minus car direction. One related insight from this point is that it is possible to talk about the feature directions a model has rather than how like any direction corresponds to a feature, there's just some linear combination of other features. It's also worth noting that you might try to restrict to this with like features are linear functions of the input or something. But actually, any linear function of features the model or is representing is in some sense already a feature the model has access to. Like the entire point of doing things like having a neuron that represents a feature is the model is doing some nonlinear processing to get there, and it can't just be a purely linear feature of the input. That was maybe confused. Does that make sense, Jess? 
I think a rephrase would be useful, but I'm not sure I can point it the right direction or like subspace that I want rephrased. Makes sense. Yeah, maybe a useful thing to keep in mind about models is that even though we might, even if it is the case that they have these like features corresponding to directions, they also have access to every linear combination of those features because they could just project onto like, I don't know, the sum of cat plus car. Naively, this seems kind of dumb, but this means that you could represent things as, I don't know, if you've got like a floppy ear direction and a fur direction and a dog snout direction and some random other shit, you mm. could kind of take the average of those as like a single dog feature that's kind of like, are all the doggy things present? And in some sense, this is like, this doesn't need a separate direction, but this isn't really a superposition. This is just like a feature that is a linear function of other features is just already represented for free. Yeah. And this is because things inside a model are just these, are like models are vector, are like machines for doing linear algebra that are full of vectors. Sorry, turning my mic. And the key thing, and a key thing in this is the models are like, models are doing some important things to, models immediately have access to all linear functions of their input, and the only part bit of their job is getting non-linear functions of the input. Yeah. yeah this I is not that actually sense. that related to this point. I just think it's a useful point to make about networks. Yes. Features as interpretable properties. Yeah. Features are human understandable concepts. This is kind of legit, but also we kind of want to allow for models having shit we don't understand. One thing I find super, this seems pretty legit to me. One like really ambitious outcome for mechanistic interpretability that I'd love to see is us taking a model that has learned some concept that humans do not already understand and then learning it from that model. I have this really dumb example in my grokking work where I learned this weird ass Fourier, like discrete Fourier transform of trick identity based algorithm for doing modular addition. This is like not actually remotely original and there are a bunch of nice ways of understanding it, but like I hadn't thought about it. I learned something new. And one concrete thing I'd be really excited about is if someone does something like build on Tom McGrath's Alpha Zero interpretability work to learn new ways of playing chess or new chess insights, or some biologist goes and interprets AlphaFold to learn new things about protein folding. And it seems really legit to me that this should be included in the definition of feature. And oh, this is a fun definition. This is this kind of cute circular thing that's like, Maybe a feature can be just be defined as if you had like a really big model, would it eventually have a neuron to represent it? And I both think this is a terrible definition and a kind of cute definition because it's like clearly circular, so it's terrible, but also kind of seems legit in the if features are sufficiently are like non trivially useful, probably a large model will eventually have them. One underlying concept here that I find useful for reasoning about all this stuff, which I think they mentioned later in the paper, and if not, credit to Chris for mentioning this to me when we were chatting about the paper, is this idea of the feature importance curve. So the idea of the feature importance curve is that we have some kind of steadily is we imagine we have this list of like every conceptual feature, every feature you could possibly conceive of that might be useful for understanding the world. From things like, is this a noun? Is this an a romance novel? To like, who is Neil Nanda? Who is Jess Smith? What did Neil Nanda have for breakfast on the morning of Tuesday, Tuesday the 25th of October? The latter ones are like, not particularly useful, but probably a little bit more useful than nothing for the task the model is trained in. And you can kind of picture this as this curve 
where the y-axis is kind of how much the feature, sorry, that's terrible, terrible drawing. So you can kind of think of this as, I don't know, maybe importance times sparsity of the feature, like how much it matters. The x-axis is like all features. And you can think of this as like a curve with the features in sorted order and the importance and sparsity kind of steadily drops off. And uh, I'm not all claiming this is like a rigorous thing or a thing we could make, but it seems like a thing that is probably true about the world. And within this framing, you can kind of think, if you've got a model with like a thousand neurons and you look at the thousand points here, and then you go up to like 4,000, then you have, yeah, if you've got like the thousandth point here, the four thousandth point here, then what you can one way you can think about what's going on is that the model could just represent these first thousand. It's instead going to represent these four thousand, but with some interference. But it might pick the first like hundred because these are really important and give these dedicated dimensions. Because you know, being able to represent the really unimportant four thousandth thing. It's probably not worth interference for the hundredth if you can instead give the hundredth its own dedicated dimension. And because kind of features getting their own dimension should not really be affected by how important the feature is, this kind of seems like a reasonably legit thing you might care about. The model would do. Like the cost of giving it a its own dimension is going to drop the more features it's representing because it's going to lose the marginal least important features. And within the within the framework of this feature importance curve, like for a sufficiently large model, the cost of giving a feat any given feature its own dimension is going to drop to zero, so it should give it its own dimension. One th other thing to note is that the exact feature importance curve is going to differ depending on the data distribution. Like if I train, I don't know if I train GPT three on mostly Wikipedia and the internet and like 1% code, then that's going to be pretty different. It's going to have a pretty different importance distribution than if I train it on like 99% code, 1% Wikipedia, because then code features are going to be like way higher in importance and Wikipedia features are going to be way lower. But there's probably going to eventually be a model that's worth representing any of those features so long as they're there somewhere. How much sense does the feature importance curve make, Jess? I think it's really good. I think it's a pretty, one of the nice things about it is like a lot of these things are like pretty natural, which is to say like, like I, I, I think actually this was mentioned in the mathematical framework video you did talking about transformers having some space to zero out and, and negate features. Like, I think it's, you mentioned the perspective there of like, I don't know, optimization is just good at figuring shit out. <laughs> and like, I think like a lot of these what's cool about this work and like actually one of the experiments in here is one of the cooler ones I've seen where I don't know empirically neural networks just figure shit out <laughs> and and like it, it's maybe hard to like totally predict a priori all the things that they'll figure out but like once once you know they're presented it's like yeah I guess that kind of makes sense like I can see a, a reason for that existing mm. or being the case or yeah. being a description. Yeah, this feels like one of the deeper insights I've had as I've gotten more into AI research. Like, naively, you really want to think about how AI works. How would I design the model to do this? Because, you know, I'm a human, I'm smart, the model is stupid. Obviously, I can outsmart it. But in practice, almost every researcher who's tried really hard to be smart and careful and cautious has, sorry, smart and careful and deliberate and principled, has, like, kind of failed and the stack more layers and make this enormous blob of compute crowd have made GPT-3 and Palm and DALI and AlphaZero. Well, AlphaZero was kind of smart, but it was also a stack a lot of compute. And some smart techniques have kind of helped, but a lot of it is just give the model more horsepower to figure out how to do sensible shit. And this is just kind of like a weird property of the world and of AI that optimizer, optimization is really powerful. If you just set things up so the network can go do shit 
this just kind of works, man. And yeah. So yeah. Optimizers, powerful, weird, fucky. Do I have anything else to say on that point? Yeah, I guess another point is just when you go poking around inside models, lots of weird janky shit where like, ah, uh, this isn't set up in a very principled way. I'm not really sure that the this is like the right thing to do to like make the model's life easier, but it tends to find a way around it. One experiment I'm currently exploring is what happens if you train a model without positional embeddings, and it rederives positional embeddings on its own. A motto I like is life finds a way, and networks networks are going to figure out how to do things. They're smarter than me in some extremely weird, narrow sense. But yeah, yeah. This is the stuff I was saying earlier about features as directions. Features are nonlinear functions of the input, but you can read, but features are represented in an act, inner activation space of the model as a direction. Yep, neural networks are incredibly linear things with like some nonlinearities in the middle. Oh, this is a cute way of framing it. So we know from scaling laws that a pretty big, like one of the main components in how good a model is, is how much compute it has, how many flops or like floating point operations per second it has. And if you like actually look at the GPU and like the computation, the vast majority of the computation is these enormous matrix multipliers. And all of these weird shit, like softmaxes and jellus, are just pretty easy to calculate, and are like a tiny fraction of that. It's not obvious to me the flop ratio is like the right lens, but it's probably tracking something relevant. Yeah, a lot of this bears on stuff I've already been talking about. Yeah. So what this is saying is that a natural thing you might do if you're a model, if you want to represent some feature about the world, is just have a feature whose input is like a linear combination of like previous features that are kind of related to this thing and tell it to fire and so the thing will fire if like more of the correlated features are there or not yeah so this is what i was saying about how models kind of read out information from the from the internal activation space with by embedding it in some larger space which is the same as dotting it with some direction in space or projecting onto that direction. And this means, and just like the kind of only way a model can read information from some vector space is by projecting that onto some direction. Because like fundamentally, the way you compute a neuron is you take some big activation vector, you dot with the input weight to that neuron to get like a single real value, and then you apply a element-wise nonlinear function to that value. And dot with the input weights to that neuron, i.e. the like row in this big matrix multiply. No, whatever. Either the ro a row or a column in a big matrix multiply, you would just literally project it on some direction. So it's really natural to want to have directions be meaningful. And what on earth is this argument? Huh. What? I have no idea what this means. I should go read that old Chris blog post. Cool. I have no idea what this means. Hopefully it isn't that important. <laughs> the way the section is written, I think these are just like intuitions for you might care about this linear representation thing and not some like deeply important thing for following the paper but i apologize this is going to massively screw us over later possibly i should have read this paper more carefully before trying to do a book through but whatever and yeah yeah this is the stuff i was saying earlier about how you might want to have weirder representations like i don't know if you have these if you have like different squares representing features you could imagine having some layers that carefully read out from the squares. Like if you've got a ReLU, which activates if you're like above this line, 
and a really good activates the paper above this line, take the difference. That tells you where you are in here. You can do the same for these directions. So you could totally have like neurons that let you decode some weird internal representation like this, but like, I don't know, maybe you can think of it as a linear representation with more exotic features. I broadly vibe with this. This is probably a pretty inefficient claim. And yeah, superposition, the entire point of this paper. It can store more features than it has room and term before. How am I doing? Good. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of this is stuff that I've mostly already covered. So, though I do generally think with this kind of paper, you want to spend a lot of time on the conceptual section and a lot less time on the other sections. But yeah. So, privileged and non privileged basis. Talking about this earlier, it's just the idea that there are like some. There are like some directions, probably the basis directions that you expect to map a priori, and these to be mean and features to be meaningful and to be aligned with these directions. Non-privileged basis means features correspond to directions, but not quite to the things we would have predicted. Superposition is the idea there are more directions than there are dimensions, which is not the same as there are as many directions as dimensions, but they are not basis aligned. And yeah, these are just two areas for maths that can be somewhat relevant. I don't know that much about either of these. Almost orthogonal vectors, links to some key theorem in that. And a headline result is if you want to have almost orthogonal vectors in n-dimensional space, where we define almost orthogonal as that dot product is less than some epsilon, you can have exponentially many. So I think that the constant is pretty small and pretty weird, so I don't know how much this is relevant to real networks. One wild result is I think in 64-dimensional space, you can have 1,024 vectors whose dot product is mutually at most one-eighth due to some weird binary construction, which is just wild beer. And compressed sensing. So here the key, so this is, this is actually pretty cute. So here the idea is, from an information theoretic point of view, can we fully reconstruct things if we project them to a lower dimensional space? Naively, probably not. But what you, let's see, I can't remember the toy example for this, not super important. These are just Areas of maths you might dig into if you're trying to come up with formal mathematical theories for superposition, but you don't really need to understand it. Yeah, this is a lot of what I was talking about earlier, where if you have sparse T, so the all right, so the notation in this diagram is totally fucked. So what's going on is that in this diagram, the yellow represents a single sparse feature which is present, and the blue represents the fake reading on these two directions that comes from interference. Here, you've got two real features, the blue ones, and then the yellow is the sum of the projections onto this axis, and this is a fake activation. And so what this is saying is that if you have sparse things, you're going to get way less interference, and it's going to matter way less. But if you have less sparsity than the model might expect, you might get a ton of interference and this might totally screw with it. One thing worth noting is that with sparsity, there's always like some fraction of the time the model's going to be massively screwed over because it gets unlucky and there's a bunch of features it didn't expect. Or like there happen to be lots of features that all interfere with the same dimension. And I don't know, models minimize expected loss. This is just means that there's like some probability of a big term in the loss. You hope the model learns to deal with this. And yeah. Oh, yes. So this is what Jess was saying earlier about the simulation hypothesis. So here, this idea is it short, we know that bigger models can do better than smaller models. One intuition is bigger models can both do more computation and represent more features. If we're using superposition, we can kind of simulate a much bigger model with a smaller model. And this creates interference, especially in neural activations. But like, maybe this works. 
And I think a lot of the claims of this paper, that are at least in a toy setting, this just kind of does work. And yeah, yes. I know that they've mostly talked about superposition with neurons, and then say it can actually occur in representations with an unprivileged basis. In my opinion, most of this paper is building intuitions for what happens with an unprivileged basis, and only a bit at the end so they talk about with respect to neurons. One like particularly important implication of the simulate larger model hypothesis that it's worth drawing out is that if this is true, then superposition is going to be fundamentally tied to model performance. And we are not going to be able to get rid of it without fucking over model performance. And this is really annoying because superposition is really annoying and it makes it way harder to interpret a model because it's way harder to find the features and it's way harder to reason about the features because there's also interference and the interference also screws us over. This is particularly bad because the model only cares about what happens at inference time where most features are not present at any given time, but like we might care about looking at the weights where like in some sense every feature is present in the weights and sparsity of high is much less. And so a thing you might really want to do is get rid of superposition with some kind of architecture change or regularization or training technique. And another Transformer Circuits paper called Softmax Linear Units tries to do this, and if it is true that models are trying to simulate a larger network, this is probably just completely Doom's line of research. And I see a lot of the point of architecture changes for interpretability or regularization for interpretability as we can actually make a technique that we could get, I don't know, the people making GPT-4 to use so that we could have a better shot at taking this superhuman model and interpreting it. And I think a lot of the ways this interpretability research ultimately matters is if we can take these large human level to superhuman level models we're going to get in the future that might be dangerous and look inside them and see what's going on and maybe use this to help align them. And if techniques to make them easier to align will screw over their performance, I basically don't expect we're going to get the people making AGI to use them. And so if superposition is fundamentally impossible to fix without breaking performance, that's a massive pain. Though one point they make later in the paper that I find pretty inspiring is that you might expect that there's kind of a trade-off between simulate a bigger model with more interference and simulate a smaller model with less interference. And what generally seems to happen as you vary a model's hyperparameter is that rather than it being like, oh, if you have, say, a le learning rate on the x-axis and loss on the y-axis, there being this like really narrow valley of the perfect learning, perfect learning rate, what actually happens is you tend to have like a pretty shallow basin where like optimal learning rate might be 1a minus 3, but 1a minus 4 or 1a minus 2 are like basically good enough and within a certain amount is like you basically don't notice. And this is in general what hyperparameters tend to look like. And you might think about amount of interference versus superposition as another hyperparameter. And you might expect there to be a pretty wide basin of how much is optimal. So you might be able to reduce superposition a bunch without really breaking performance, but you probably won't be able to fix it. Yeah. So yeah, this is summarizing hierarchy of feature properties. Is there a privileged basis? Are they basis aligned? Are they in superposition versus non-superposition? But still directions? Are features directions at all? And who knows how they're represented? I'm not actually convinced that superposition versus non-super... Yeah, sorry, maybe the way I would phrase this hierarchy is, can you decompose things into features at all? If not, probably kind of fucked. Are features directions? Are these directions not in superposition? Like, are there at most as many as dimensions? And do they align with some actual neuron thing? And yeah, claim. The first two are pretty fundamental. If not, we need to wildly rethink our approach. The latter two are less fundamental and hopefully fixable. Cool. Ready to jump in, or anything else conceptual that I should dig more into? I think it, I think it's worth maybe stating like one perspective on like the importance of research into like 
understanding how common things like superposition are and how and how much we should expect to have to pay in terms of performance to avoid it, which is like, if it's going to be a huge cost and performance to avoid, well, so one, if there are ways to effectively avoid superposition, and two, if they require a huge cost, you really want to know that as soon as possible. Like, I, I think I think it is like worth emphasizing that like, that could like change the direction of research over the course of years. If you like figure out sooner that like, oh, like there's just no hope to understanding these large networks at the highest levels of performance. I think, you know, decision makers would maybe take different routes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Definitely agreed. And yeah, it's also just not clear to me how much the right approach to interpretability fundamentally is to try to interpret smaller models, get insights that will generalize and work your way up, and yeah, try to like slowly work your way up to larger models using the insights you've gained and the techniques you've validated versus things are just fundamentally different. Do you interpret models versus small models versus like GPT-3? And I think this is just like a pretty non-obvious question because are like much, much easier to work with. You don't need to fuck around with like multi-GPU or multi-node setups, which are a nightmare, <laughs> but large models are going to have like deeper and more abstract features. In at least image models, larger models have more cleanly represented features and maybe techniques just don't generalize. And I don't know, I kind of want people, my take is that interpreting toy models and uh, even more interpreting small models is the most promising direction. And the th things we learn and the techniques we get probably generalize, but like, and I've already seen things I think are promising progress in that front, but like, I could totally be wrong. And I think as a field, we really need people doing kind of all steps along this trajectory. And yeah, so this is the experimental setup. I don't really like this diagram. The way I think about what they're doing is that actually the input is this disentangled model. They project down to a bottleneck and then they project back up to a disentangled thing. And they have a linear map for doing this and they've got another linear map for undoing this. In their diagram, they think of it as like linear map one, linear map two, linear map three, linear map four, where these are the identity, but whatever. Linear map down, linear map back up. I'm not sure it's super important that they use the same matrix for going in and its transfers for going out. I think it makes some of the analysis easier and I don't think it makes a massive difference. I also heard something about it makes life easier because you can think of there as just being like a single map between this basis and the original basis, rather than two maps that you kind of need to reason about somewhat independently. And you can think of W as being inherent to how the map works. I'm not sure this like matters a ton. General research lesson. You make some pretty arbitrary decisions which have important downstream consequences in your results. It's not super clear what the right way to do this is. And yeah, so... These, I talked a bit about this earlier, features are sparse. Some things happen a lot, some things do not happen as much. There are many, many features, more features than neurons. There's this infinite feature curve, which includes things like Neil Nanda, features vary in importance. And yeah, I explained this earlier, but just to briefly recap, we give each feature a sparsity and an importance. We say that a feature is zero with probability sparsity and uniform zero one otherwise, and you weight its loss with the importance as just a coefficient. I think it is worth just like making sure you really understand what this setup is, though I expect it's not that sensitive to a bunch of these details. Like, I don't know if you picked the positive real part of a null distribution, I expect a lot of the results would be basically the same. And I think some of the replications at the end show that. But yeah, so two models. Both of these models look like linear map in, bottleneck activation, linear map out with no activation in the middle. 
first one is just linear. Second one is linear with a relu at the end. The reason this is importantly different is that the relu lets you... Oh yeah, another important thing is they've only got a bias at the end. Um, they don't have a bias in the middle. That probably just doesn't really matter in this case because a bias in the middle would just be, you could just fold it into the bias at the end because you have an effective bias of B1 plus W transpose B2. And this is a tangent, not super important. And then it's got the relu. And the intuitively, the significance of the relu is that the relu lets you get rid of a bunch of noise and interference. Yes. Also, great. So, yeah, why do they add a bias? Something's pretty reasonable. They add a bias because it lets the model set features to their expected value. And also, if you can set the bias to a negative amount, it lets the relu get rid of some amount of the random noise. Just, I think this is like a reasonably important thing to understand, but I think they cover it later. So I'm not gonna dig in in detail. Yeah, why is this mathematically principled? Oh, interesting. So this is a mild mathy tangent, not super important, but it says you might expect W to kind of try to be almost orthogonal because you want each of the directions representing features to be as orthogonal as possible. And if a matrix is orthogonal, i.e. all its rows have dot product zero, then its transpose is its inverse. So by telling it W, W transpose should be like approximately the identity. We're kind of giving it a bit of a nudge to be even more orthogonal y. And yep. Final point. Yeah. Yeah. One cute thing to note here is that the loss function we're using actually matters a fair bit. So here we're using cross entropy loss, which you can kind of think of as saying the output of our model is a vector. The true output is another vector, which is also the input in this case. And the mean squared error loss is the squared distance between these two vectors. And this has a few implications. Most notably, it can kind of be decomposed into an independent term for each of the dimensions, but it's, sorry, that's not the important point. The important point is that in each dimension, we're penalized more the further we are from it in a kind of disproportionate nonlinear way. And the optimal answer is always going to be the expected value of what the true thing is in that position. Because the expected value, if you've got like a random variable, you need to approximate the constant. The expected value of that variable is always going to be the optimal answer to that. This is kind of a massy tangent you don't need to follow in detail. but there are some important ways in which the fact that we're using mean squared error loss is pretty different from something like cross entropy loss. Another thing is just, if we use something like softmax, like the softmax using cross entropy loss, this in some ways gives us a much better ability to clean up noise because softmax does a lot more extremizing. Like if you have, if you add one, if you like have softmax of like 0, 5, 0, 0, 0, and like many zeros, and you do a softmax, you get something that's like really big here. And then if you make this a six, this gets the like difference is like even more than if it started as zeros and you made this into a one. So like the further you get from zero, the more the softmax pushes things away from each other. And this actually gives the model a much bigger ability to clean up noise because if you had a softmax at the end, it would it lets you just like get rid of small things close to zero a lot more easily. While if we're using mean squared error loss, it's actually like a fair bit harder and relu can only clean up things that are less than zero and kind of can't do much for things above zero. Long massy tangent. You don't need to understand that in detail. How much sense does that make, Jess? Great. So, yeah, basic results. So, how to visualize things. A general meta point is just 
a lot of the hard part of interpretability is networks are high dimensional objects. In this case, they're not actually that high dimensional objects because they're tiny toy things like 20 and five, but thinking about how to represent them is like a lot of the challenge of engaging with high dimensional vectors and getting good at data visualization and also thinking about how to do it. It's pretty important. And um, so the way they do it here is they take this matrix W transpose W. This is kind of the, what happens if you multiply out this, like these two linear maps to get something from big to big, which kind of has this small factorization. And then for each pair of inputs, you just write, you just look at the number, which is like how much they map to each other. And like in a perfect world, what you'd get is just like all ones on the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. The identity matrix in practice, if we see interference, we're going to expect to see like, I don't know, numbers off the diagonal. And so within the frame of this picture, we see five numbers along the main diagonal and then zeros everywhere else. And this is saying, got five dimensions. I'm just going to use the dimensions to represent the first five features. And then everything else is a zero. And it's worth noting that, yeah, it's worth noting that these are ordered, these are put in order of importance. So like, if the features were just randomly permuted, you would expect it to see five dots on the diagonal in arbitrary positions. But because the most important are first and the model prefers to represent important features, it puts them all up here. And here's the bias. The bias is basically representing the expected value because for each of these, it can't represent them. But I know half the time it's going to be between zero and one. So the expected value is a quarter ish. And that's the way you minimize mean squared error. That isn't a super important point. It's just worth kind of knowing why the different bits happen. Yeah. So this is a really cute idea that I would not have come up with and I think is really nice, which is this idea of coming up with a metric for dimensionality. And what this is saying, so the goal is we want to come up with a quantitative way of representing how much is the model given a feature its own direction versus given it how much is the model given a feature its own dedicated dimension versus dimension it's sharing with a bunch of other things? And it's like not obvious how you do this, but one way you could think about it is you take, so let's, so let's think about the concrete example of an antipodal pet. You've got feature one and you've got feature two. Obviously, our metric should say there are two dimensions here. And this metric says, look at the line through the origin that means this feature. Look at the points where each feature appears and take the sum of squares and divide and say that the sum of, if the sum of squares is one, that, sorry, the metric we use says project each feature onto this line, square it, square each of these points, and then add them up and look at what fraction comes to the original feature. So here you've got one and one, and so this is one over one plus one, and it's a half. This sure seems like a legitimate metric. If we have something like, I don't know, triangles, it makes sense intuitively, a Equilateral triangle is the best way to have three things spaced out in two dimensions. And if we project onto this, I these are both going to be a half. And so this these two are a half. And this is going to be one. And there's kind of like, I don't know, two natural things you could do here. One is you could just add up one over one plus a half plus a half. And just get, yeah. yeah, you could take like a linear thing and get one over two, or you could take a quadratic thing and get like one over 
one plus a quarter plus a quarter and say that x has two thirds and like naively these both seem kind of reasonable things to do i think it's pretty fair to say that this it has more of its own dimension in this world than this world like if each feature is independently sparse this world's going to be much less of a big deal it's going to be easier to clean up the noise because you can just say if things are less than a half set to zero otherwise set it to not otherwise keep it as is or something and so i don't know i think this is like a more reasonable principle thing in general i have the fuzzy intuition that when you're doing anything with vectors squaring is more principled than taking absolute values but i don't know oh yeah sorry this is minus a half and minus a half so here we'd be taking the absolute value because one minus a half minus half is a stupid thing to have on the denominator here we're taking the sum of squares so it doesn't matter and yeah dot product is reasonable because it's like the amount of interference you get when you try to read out the feature and if this is bigger than one then if like one of these terms is bigger than one that means that there's another feature that matters even more for this direction than the feature we care about which is super dumb and i would not expect that to happen and yeah i have no idea why this hat is there my guess is that's a typo yeah i think that the key thing to take away from this is there is a fairly simple metric we can come up with that is a rough proxy for how much a feature has its own dimension versus sharing with others that roughly tracks our intuition for what a feature should mean. And yes. Or, sorry, I just realized that I described a different metric from the equation shown on here. So the metric I described was w i dot w i so the metric they have here is the dot product of the feature with every other feature not including itself squared and added up the thing i described is the feature dotted with itself which is just one because i know we assume the feature dotted with itself plus their thing and the hat means that we're taking the unit vector in the direction of wi not like the actual direction wi this is important because we want to allow our features to be varying dimensions and the equation wj dot wi hat means what do we get what number do we get when we project onto the line we're using when we're reading out the feature but where this could be the thing for the original feature might be like three or it might be like a half and we assume there's some absolute scale of length that was a confused explanation how am i doing jess i think pretty solid i think yeah i think in my head anyway some of the like insights from this section though are like they're like almost visual. Like if you, if, I think if you scroll down a bit more, maybe I'm misremembering this. Yeah. I, I don't know if you want to spend more time um, on this too. I'm pretty good about moving on. I think the key thing I want people to take away is this is a reasonable metric. If this metric is zero, the feature has its own dimension. If it's bigger than one, then that means there are other features that could activate this feature like more strongly than itself. I'm honestly not actually convinced that this is like the right framing because if we assume sparsity, then like the fact that there's lots of other features that can in aggregate activate it more than the feature itself kind of doesn't really matter if it's super sparse, but yeah. And so these diagrams are pretty important. The key th way this works is important features up here unimportant features down here we give the feature a bar whose length represents how big the direction corresponding to it is intuitively if the model is not representing a feature it should be zero because why would you have it it's just stupid if the model is representing it it's gonna if the model is just giving it a dedicated dimension it's gonna be one because we we're just gonna map this to like the first 
hidden dimension, we're going to map that to like the output, and we want all of this to just be the identity. It might be bigger or less than one if it's dealing with interference and superposition and fucky shit like that. And then we color the bar according to how much the feature has its own dimension versus its share, with like black meaning own dimension, yellow meaning share. And so now we have our first beautiful graphic. I really appreciate how much the team who made this paper spent making beautiful graphics. It brings me so much joy. And yeah, so here we just got the linear model and we say that we're going to vary our feature sparsity a bunch. And on the right, we see that as we vary feature sparsity, we go from really each feature has its own dedicated dimension to a few features have dedicated dimensions, but some features split. And so the way to interpret this diagram is the model decomposes things into like two pairs and three singles. Well, like within a pair, you've got plus one, minus one, plus one, and minus one. And what this is saying is that, so let's imagine we've got two input features and a single hidden dimension. This is saying we can, we've got two inputs, x and y. We're going to map things to x minus y. And then we're going to create the output of x minus y and y minus x. And you can kind of think of all this as as being like a, a matrix multiply, one minus one, one on x, y, which if you do this map mole, you just get this out. And a way you, to interpret these diagrams are just like, if you look at any subset, it's just a matrix and you're multiplying by that matrix. And this is a sensible thing to do. Because if you apply a ReLU to this, if X is there and Y is not, it's positive, this is the entity, we're happy. If a Y is there and X is not, X is zero, Y gets set to zero because it's a negative, we're happy. If X and Y are both there, we're fucked, because this is now like some random garbage we don't know how to deal with. And if X and Y are both not there, this is just a zero, so we're happy. And yeah, we see that the bias on those terms is basically zero. And so this is like heavily exploiting sparse. Like 30% of the time, any given feature is there. So if we just like map out the probabilities, it's like 9% that both of their 20, something like 21% that eat that like X is there and not Y, 21% that Y is there and not X. And whatever the remainder is for like 49% that neither is there. And like the model gets great performance in this 81% of the time and terrible performance 9% of the time. Feels like a good trend. The other, and so importantly, exact numbers, not relevant, but the important thing here is that the sparser it is, the less these interference things matter when multiple things are there. But the question of what happens when y is there and x is not really matters because this is big, because it only requires one number to be there, not both. And so the fact that if y is there and x is not, this thing can be cleaned up is way more important than if x and y are both there, can they both be cleaned up? Like, can we extract x without getting y? Bias remains expected value, though it's a bit more faded, which is kind of weird, don't know why. The other important thing to note is that these are localized. Like there is a single direction in this hidden space that corresponds to x minus y. We've got four things in superposition, but it is not the four things in some weird mess. It's the matrix is cleanly split into two pairs where each pair interferes with each other, but not between pairs. And it is not at all obvious that this is what you should expect to happen. And yeah, as we increase the sparsity, we see that you get like nearly everything is in these weird paired things. Here, all of these features are in these paired things, 
And then you also get some features that are like in weirder things where they've represented a bit or like whatever the fuck these are. And we'll interpret the like high sparsity regime a lot more, but the key observations to make here are you can have re regimes where one feature gets dedicated things or three get dedicated things and others are in superposition. It somewhat tends to localize things. And the sparser you are, the more superposition you get. And you can kind of fit in like more than, way more than the number of dimensions you have. Here, more than twice the number of dimensions you have. Another interesting observation is that the model kind of doesn't obviously have a clear association between which features it pairs together. Like here you kind of have this pretty pattern. I would be pretty surprised if that replicated across random seeds. Here this pairs with that one, and it's neither this pairs with the next most important thing, nor this pairs with like the least important thing. It seems kind of random. I don't know. This just... And so one way you could think about this is that so long as each of these four features is in a pair, the interference on each feature is just going to be fixed. It doesn't matter whether the interference comes from a more or less important feature. And because loss is just like a linear combination of the loss from like each term, it doesn't care about whether the interference damage to the two most important features are correlated or uncorrelated, because it's all added together. Making sense so far? The final takeaway from this diagram is that in the linear model, no matter how you vary the sparsity, here they've got 1a minus 3, so like the probability any given feature is there is 1a minus 3. It just gives five things that dedicated dimension. I'm not sure there's like that much of a deep insight here, I think this is mostly a consequence of the fact that we're using mean squared error loss, and it just like happens to be a true property about linear maps and mean squared error loss that like you can't get any value from superposition because mean squared error loss measures distance, and I don't know. Getting into this is not super important. I predict that if you replaced the mean squared error loss at the end of this with like cross entropy loss measuring the probability that any feature was present or something, it would now start using superposition a bunch, even with a purely linear thing. Though you could argue that the fact that I'm giving it a softmax makes this a nonlinearity like Relu it can clean stuff up with. I don't know. I think this is getting well into the toy model not generalizing to real models regime. So, but yeah. I do think that this experiment is like kind of the table stakes for what to learn from this paper. And I'm not entirely convinced that reading further in this paper is like a great use of time. I think that just like this shit is like half the value I got from this paper, plus understanding the underlying concepts. This is just like a really, really good, elegant experiment that I think demonstrates a lot of really deep things about how real models work. And it's sufficiently simple and elegant that I broadly believe this is just a true thing about real models that does generalize. Yeah, this is just replicating that with like more features and a bigger hidden dimension. Yeah, so this is, this is trying to do like a mathematical analysis on what's going on here. I honestly have not fully followed the details here myself and I don't think it's super important. They use this paper from 2014, where some people looked at linear deep neural networks, looked at how they learned, linear meaning no activation functions, and turns out it's pretty tractable to just look at that in a lot of detail. And yeah, sorry, turns out it's pretty tractable to just like look at that, look at those models, and come up with some nice closed form equations. I don't think it's worth worrying about where the equations come from, but they get this equation, which says the loss is the, like, in some sense, for each feature i, the loss should be the importance of i times one, like, 
one minus the norm of the thing that it gets squared or squared, and then the sum of the importance of i, here it's j, but it should be symmetric, and then this, how much of a dimension it gets score, which is the sum of the squared dot products with everything else. So this is kind of the squared interference with everything else, and then the benefit from getting this feature. I think that this, I think that this is going to have to be assuming that there's no sparsity, because I don't see any sparsity terms in this equation. So like, all would be weird if you could factor out the sparsity terms. But yeah, the like key interpretation beyond what the terms actually mean is this represents how much the model has represented its feature. Note that good loss is small loss, so you want wi to be close to one. And this is kind of saying how much of the model's activations represent this feature. How much does the model have the ability to like engage with it internally? I will note that I don't, I'm not convinced in general that like size of vector corresponding to feature is like actually an interesting thing to intrinsically look at. I think this only comes out because we've made the input and output maps be symmetric. Like if you imagine untying them, so you now have w and w2, you could totally just like scale this down by a factor of 1 over 100, scale this up by a factor of 100, the input and output are exactly the same, but like these things are pretty different. So the fact that it's one minus the size of w, I think is just an artifact of this artificial setting. But there is something to be said about relative sizes between features. So like, I think there's still some substance to it. But yeah, this represents how useful is having this feature. This represents how non-orthogonal it features. How much interference is there between this one feature and other features? And kind of the model can make this smaller at the cost of making this bigger. It can make this smaller, of course, making this bigger, and it's kind of choosing a balancing point. And like a priori, it would just be pretty surprising if it wanted to have zero interference and a ton of feature benefit, or zero feature benefit and a ton of interference. It would actually be impossible for it to have zero feature benefit and a ton of interference. Sorry, it would be impossible for it to have whatever. I don't think what I was saying was important. Key thing is there are these two competing things and these push against each other and the model's going to find some equilibrium point and deep learning is really powerful. So it just kind of works. And yeah, so here they're doing a bunch of integration for the ReLU case. And I don't know, I don't think that the exact details here are incredibly important. Um, the thing they're looking at here is what is the loss when we have vectors that contain exactly one element? No elements be present. We could have one element be present. We could have the probability we've got one element be present is like n times sparsity. The probability we've got, or no, it's slightly messier. I don't really care about the details here. Let's skip this. I don't think this is like that important. The key thing to take away from this section is you can do maths to find a feature benefit term and an interference term. This validates our intuition. There are these two forces pushing against each other. You can kind of do maths to the ReLU case. I feel like this maths is getting a bit too specific to the toy model. And I think interference versus speech benefit thing is the main thing that really generalizes. And yeah. It's worth noting that this interference is the, what do you get when this feature is there? Oh, sorry, when feature two is there and feature one is not there, what is the damage to the loss on feature one? It, there are other terms that aren't shown here that are the loss for feature two and feature one both being there, but like who really cares? In this case, because like things with exactly one element were more likely than things with two elements. But yeah, maths, tangent, how much it represents the feature versus levels of interference. How comprehensible is that, Jess? Sorry, I double-clicked on mute. I think it's pretty good. I think 
so I, I, I have to run soonish. So maybe it's worth like tying things together or something. I think, I think the, the rest of the paper is, I think, I think we've covered like the most valuable ideas to me. I don't know if you agree. Makes sense. I think one of the coolest stuff, I think I might on my own just like skim through the rest and like do that as a follow-up thing. I think there are some cool ideas in here. Cool. But yeah, I think if you stop watching here, this is pretty reasonable. Cool. I think one thing mm -hmm. that I found cool to connect mm -hmm. this to is I think fairly recent Redwood work around analytical approach to the same topic. I think it's called polysemanticity and capacity in neural networks or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, they have a recent paper out about this, which I should really read and I've not yet got, out to, got around to reading. So yeah. I'm bad at reading papers. But yeah. Yeah, I'll put a link to that in the description of this video. So zooming out and kind of trying to tie things together, I think there are a few key things in here that are worth keeping in, that are like actual deep lessons to take about real networks. The first is, at least in toy models, we can get superposition and like really study it. And it is meaningfully important to the model for reducing its loss. Combined with the conceptual arguments and theoretical evidence for why we might see a superposition, and the fact that we see shit like polysemanticity, even though it just does not make any sense that it would be useful to have polysemanticity in a world where you had exactly as many features as neurons, because polysemanticity introduces interference, is like pretty damn suggestive evidence that what's going on tells us is the model has more features to represent than it has dimensions. The, it seems likely that it will give some features a dedicated dimension and some features will kind of share dimensions with a bunch of interference. And it's choosing a balancing act between interference and representing a feature. It's, yeah, choosing a balancing act between interference and representing a feature. The model is choosing how much to represent, yeah. And this trade-off is kind of there for each feature and the right amount is probably gonna vary depending on the feature and how important it is and how sparse it is and how sparse other things are. The sparser the features are, the more useful it is to have polysemanticity and superposition. And this isn't, I would kind of argue that the only thing the paper's really shown so far is you get polysemanticity in a linear bottleneck, like the residual stream, rather than actually in neurons. And I feel like I've got a much less clear understanding of how this will happen in real neurons. But one insightful thing here is that the model is, hmm. one insightful thing here is that the model is like, not actually, I've kind of lost the thread of what I was saying there. Oh yeah, one insightful thing here is that the model is kind of choosing local subspaces to put a few features in rather than every feature interfering with everything else. It's kind of surprising to me that this is useful. I am not convinced that it is true that this would happen in if you actually have an activation function on the space yet, though I think they've got some compelling results about that later in the paper. But if true, this suggests that we can get a fair amount of traction on real models by like looking for these subspaces. And like, I don't know, if you've got an antipodal pair of like feature as positive direction, feature two as negative direction, that's like almost as good as feature as direction in my eyes. And yeah, the final useful concept I find it useful to have in my head is this idea of the feature importance curve. I think their results about varying importance and varying sparsity are like reasonably good supporting of this. I think it is just reasonably objectively true about the world that there should be some feature importance curve for any given loss function or any given distribution of like more important and less important features with a really long tail. And it seems plausible to me that models will learn that things closer to the left. There's going to be a lot of other weird factors in here, but like it seems plausible to me this is a useful abstraction to have for thinking about real models. Cool. That is my wrap up. Anything you want to add, Jess? No, I mean, quick plug for the, the post you wrote about ways to read this paper if people want to dive into it more. 
some sections that are more important, some takes. Yeah, that's all I got. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks a lot for helping me validate which things I was spending badly and help me do this walkthrough. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.